agility from the peacock, the cunning from the fox, the brains from a jackass, the jawbones from an ox. They took venom from the viper, the stinger from the bee, put them all in my old woman and bunged onto me. <laughs> I went home the other night, the wife said, drunk again. I said, yes, I'm drunk and you're ugly. I said, in the morning I'll be sober, but you'll still be ugly. <laughs> Adam and Eve in the garden dwelt, they were so happy and jolly. I wonder how they would have felt if all the leaves had been on it. <laughs> I like the girls that do, I like the girls that don't. I hate the girl that says she will, and, and then she, she says she won't. Deal, just like but the girl I like, the best of all, and I think I'll tell you why. I went home the other night, the wife said drunk again. I said, just so I'm drunk. And I said, all right. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. I brought the wife with me, because I've got the ugliest wife in the world. The ugliest wife in the world. Now, this is a funny thing. Now, this is a funny thing. I went home the other night. Why do so many people idolise Max Miller after all these years? He was known as the greatest stand-up comedian of his age. What was so special about him? Yeah, what's the difference? I'll ask you a question, I'll ask you a question, and see if you can answer it. What's the difference between a girl getting out of a car and a rude joke? I bet you don't know, I'll tell you. Sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't. <laughs> as a schoolboy, I adored Max because he seemed so filthy. Did he lead a life of unbridled sex? I wanted to find out more. I'm known as a cheeky chap. The things I say are snappy. That's why the fruity girls all fall for me. Max was just a voice on the radio to me. I never saw him in the flesh. Amongst the ghosts at the Hackney Empire, who now remembers the Max who broke box office records? Hello, Gerald. Good old Hackney, eh? He was lovely. He had this casual way with him. Yeah, I'd do a bit of a dance now about this then, you know. <laughs> and easy going and uh, had had them in, in his pocket right from the beginning. Yeah. Hey, hey, come here. He had this thing they call charisma today. We used to call it personality and hey, stage saying? presence. I'm satisfied. Now, you don't know what to wear this weather, do you, lady? It's raining again, ducky. You all right in here? That's right. You'll be all right. And he was the first to put his foot on the footlights. You know, they had the raised footlights in those days that used to shine up into your face. And he used to put his foot on it and say, Here, come here, lady. Here's a funny thing. <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying to yourself. You're saying to yourselves, Why is he dressed like that? I'll tell you why I'm dressed like this. I'm a commercial traveller and I'm ready for bed. You've got the intimacy between the performer and the audience. They say he used to find a woman in the audience and do hey, it to love, her once. Hey, hey, yes. No, lady, you know, listen, just a minute. What's she laughing? You know, I haven't done anything yet. I don't laugh. I've not got a nice figure, lady. Cheeky. Haven't I? No, I have. I'm not ducky. No, honest. No, well, when I'm talking, it's rude to interfere. It's like married life. No, no, nice lady. I'm not doing it. I'm all muscle. Honest, I'm not. Had these lovely cheeky blue eyes, you know. Very good looking, but Paloco, Max. I learned a hell of a lot from watching Max Miller. He had a trick of reaching a punchline and changing the subject at almost the same time. There were these two girls, there were these two girls. They visited me backstage. And as they left the theatre, one of them said, doesn't he dress nice? And the other said, yes, and so quickly, ear. And he had that trick of glancing warily into the wings from time to time, as if the manager or some figure of authority was waiting there to stop him if he went too far. He's on the side, sitting in a bar chair with a silk hat and a whip. And he used to repeat or emphasise key I words. And I went round looking for rooms and I knocked on a door. And a dear old lady came to the door, a nice lady. A little bit and some more, not quite so much, and then perhaps. <laughs> and that's all I want, just a little encouragement. She said, what do you want? I said, could you accommodate me? She said, I'm awfully sorry, I'm full up. I said, but surely you could squeeze me in the little back room, couldn't you? She said, I could, but I haven't got time now. <laughs> Max Miller was born Thomas Henry Sargent here in Brighton in 1895. It's fitting that Brighton, the home of the naughty postcard and the naughty weekend, should produce the naughtiest comedian in Britain. I like Max because he told jokes about sex. I liked him because he was rude and because he always had a sense of danger about him. He lived in a world of seaside landladies, commercial travellers, red lamps and innuendo. A boy took his girl to the seaside one Sunday morning, July, they hadn't seen much of each other. Sunbathing, they thought they tried, with only seaweed for a costume. They lay on the sands all the day, but now they see more of each other, because the tides wash the seaweed away. Max was born behind the glittering facade of Brighton's front, 
backstage in the slums. He came from a large family and soon had to help out with the finances. He cadded for the gentry and caught larks on the downs to sell to the posh hotels. He saw how the other half lived and it whetted his appetite for the good life. Meanwhile, the rent was due. James Sergeant, your rent's in arrears. We're going to take action. Apparently, in those days, if the tenant didn't pay up, the landlord simply removed the windows and doors from the house. And so the family was forced to move on. They were always on the move. The story goes they spent many nights under the pier. One day, Max ran away to join the circus, lured by the bright lights. But he wasn't away long. He idolized his mother, and he soon came back. Oh, ain't all proud of my old mum, the finest pal a fellow ever had. His dad was in and out of work. Max followed him around the pubs of Brighton, singing for cash, getting his first taste for applause. He got the bug, he knew what he wanted to do. Max's hero was G.H. Eliot, the chocolate-coloured coon. He used to hang around the stage door at the Brighton Hippodrome, hoping to see him. One night, Max spent sixpence on the gallery, and he couldn't keep his eyes off G.H. Eliot's feet. He had a special kind of lilt. He knew he had to get the steps right, and he practiced them under Brighton Pier. The stage struck Max formed his own little troupe and called them the Beachcombers. They performed song and dance routines to anyone who'd watch. It was a start, he was on his way. In 1914, still a teenager, he joined a cavalry regiment and set sail on a troop ship to Mesopotamia, and then on to India, where the army assigned him to concert party duties, putting his talents to good use. As all the parts had to be played by men, they waited for cavalry horses to die and stole their tails to make their wigs. Back on the Western Front, he was temporarily blinded when a shell exploded. He never forgot the experience and was generous to blind charities all his life. When he returned to Brighton after the war, he'd saved a trunk full of money for his beloved mum. But mum had died. She died in the flu epidemic. Max was devastated. Looking for anything in show business, he saw an ad in the local paper. Like comedian and entertainer wanted, apply Jack Shepard's concert party. He was taken on, but a background role was no good for Max. He wanted the stage himself. Jack Shepard ran two shows in Brighton, and when Max had finished the performance at Marine Parade, he would jump on his bike, cycle like mad to the other end of town for another show. It was here that Max met a soubrette called Kathleen Marsh. The first time I met Max was on a bus, and I saw this man this horrible bright green coat and a pink shirt and I thought the clothes were awful. I kept looking at him because they fascinated me because I'd never seen anybody wearing clothes like that before and every time I looked at him he was looking at me. But I got off the bus and he followed me. Came to the rehearsal room. I rang the bell and uh, didn't speak to him. Jack Shepard said, oh, you know each other. I said, no, we don't. 
didn't even want to know him. And uh, <laughs> he's so funny, really. Max won her over, and they were married in 1921. Max was still smarting from the loss of his mum, so Kathleen took him under her wing. They formed a double act, left Jack Shepherd, and toured the flea pits. They had no success. We were called Kitty and Max. I must have been absolutely ghastly, saying nothing about comedy or timing or anything else. And I came to the conclusion that it was he who had to have the career. He couldn't get booked as Harry Sargent. And I said, I, it's your name that's wrong, darling. And he said, well, you think of a better one. Well, I just thought, and right out of the blue, right out of the blue, I don't know where it came from, the name Max Miller. Miller's the name, lady. There'll never be another, will there? <laughs> they don't make them today, don't Kathy they? Kathy made that outfit for him, out of chintz that we cover chairs with. <laughs> chintz curtains. Oh, me calling you ladies and gentlemen. You all know what you are. <laughs> made these chintz plus fours and a uh, jacket. And said, "Hey, why you wear that? Wear a wear a hat turned up all the way around like Anthony Eden, and uh, wear brown or white shoes." And this became his outfit, and he went on and called himself the cheeky chappy. Listen, I've just come back from my holidays. I always have a wonderful time when I go on my holidays because I haven't got one of those wives who says, "Where have you been? How much have you spent? Who have you been with?" She doesn't say that. She comes with me. Over the next ten years, Max's name climbed steadily up the variety bills. He'd found the right formula. One, two, three. Max Miller used to appear regularly at the London Shoreditch, the Islington Empire, the Camberwell Palace. In the old days, in 1928, an artist could work 62 weeks in London alone. It was common knowledge that the Jewish people in the main, particularly in the East End of London, they used to be variety fans. If people ask Max Miller, are you Jewish? He never denied it, but he never said he was. He didn't say he wasn't. So people thought he was Jewish, and he gave that impression. So he had an enormous Jewish following. He was known as being very, very mean. But that wasn't the case. He used to go around collecting orange boxes, and people standing around see Max Miller with Rolls Royce, and the next thing you read in the local paper, Max Miller was getting orange boxes to use for firewood. Wonderful, wonderful publicity. It was really. Max was one of the tops of the bill at the Empire, uh, Liverpool, and I was at the Shakespeare. We, we were sitting, uh, having some supper one night, and he was talking very much about himself, and uh, I, I was very nonchalant about it. I said, oh, yes. <laughs> I was still working to get there, you know. He was much older than me. And he said, I'm getting 150 there, you know, 150. <laughs> I said, so what? Who cares? Or one of those things. And he, he lost his temper with me. And he got up, he said, I'm a good one, give you a bleating fork, new one. And then, as he'd stood up, his coat opened and he had these stays on Kathy's old-fashioned corset, you know, that women used to wear. And she said, wear these, dear, because you're getting the bulging of it. The corsets were sticking out above the pants. And he was going like that. And I, and I went... <laughs> dear, dear, dear. And he, I, he says, hey, what's the matter? Oh, God, blind me. <laughs> and they ride up this weather. <laughs> I've got new ones on tonight, lady, new ones. All rubber. Do you wear them, lady? You do, don't you, ducky? Oh, you want to wear them. They're very unhealthy. Very unhealthy. Listen, listen. You want to wear them right next to your skin. Right next to your skin. That's how you wear them. Little tiny holes. You've seen them? Yes, you have. You've seen them in the shop. I've got them on and they're nice too. Lovely. Not drawn honest, I'm not. They're nice. I feel nice. You do look funny when you take them off. You look like a golf ball. Max thought that he get called at the market in being intimate with an audience, getting the rapport with an audience, saying, here, come here. When Tommy Trinder came along and said, here, yeah, you lucky people, and everything, 
suppose he did. If it's laughter you're after, my oh, tremendous name, you know. <laughs> and of course, uh, M Miller hated the sight of him. <laughs> you lucky people! Did you meet Max Miller? Did I meet him? I was the scourge of his life. And to really annoy him, when I found I did annoy him, I bought a house three doors from his at Brighton. And he didn't have the money to move. He stayed there and suffered. Because <laughs> they had a feud. They were feuding. And he started to come down here. And he said, if I meet him, I'll throw him over the bleeding pier. <laughs> did you ever see him performing? All the yeah. time. That's how I got my act. I was like the others. I didn't stand on the side. I used to buy a seat. So I write better there. But I knew Max very, very well. Anybody will tell you that. But he was a social man. He, he never belonged to anything, never went out, never bought you any drinks. Bought himself one and drank it silently. He wouldn't spend any money. That was his trouble. Now, I remember one day I was with Ted Ray. Do you remember Ted Ray? You were a lot older than you look. Do you know, Max was telling us how many houses he owned. I've got a row of houses here, and I've got four houses here, and I've got five houses there. And Ted Ray said, Max, do us a favour, sell a house and buy a round of drinks, will you? Max, <coughs> excuse me. No, he was a very charming man, actually. <laughs> Brilliant man, but uh, he did affect my career because I look very much like him. Without the show, Max as a boy, I look like a younger edition of Max. And being both talking comic, I was suddenly coming up, and everybody kept saying, "Are you Max's son?" And he got to hear this and didn't like the idea at all. So I couldn't play at the Moss Empires because he said, "If you book him, I won't play." And that was it. So for nine years, I had to play the independent halls and uh, Moss tour and and so on, but I couldn't play the number one horse. At one time, he was very jealous of his uh, success, and he wanted everybody to praise him, you know. The, the first time he was ever one of the tops of the bill, it, it went to his head a bit, and he got a bit big-headed. I did an audition here when I was 15. The thing was, you see, it didn't matter to me if he didn't stick to the script. He would wander off on his own, feeling the audience and making them laugh here and there, and when he finally turned round to me and said, hey, Hey, that meant go back to the script and get on with it, you know. Of course, most comics learn a routine, you know, and they, and they study this routine, then ad live on that routine. With Max, he didn't have to. He just told stories that he'd heard or you know, bought or whatever it was. And then he got a system whereby he got a blue book and a white book. There was the white book and the blue book. Except in the white book, listen, there was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was very, very good, and when she was bad, she was very, very popular. Now, listen, you can't... <laughs> you can't expect too much from the white book. This is a book. <laughs> this is where we all get here. I'm on the blue book now. Mary had a little bear, to which she was so kind. I'd often seen her bear in front. I'll get on with the next book here. But not everyone thought it was funny. Some people thought it went a bit too far. The BBC wishes to make it clear that there is an absolute ban on the following. Jokes about lavatories, effeminacy in men, honeymoon couples, chambermaids, fig leaves, prostitution, lodgers, commercial travellers, ladies' underwear, for example, winter drawers on, animal habits, for example, mother frightened by a donkey, rabbits. In short, when in doubt, take it out. I remember Max was going to do something for the BBC, I don't remember what it was, some programme, and he'd sent them the script. He said, never do anything blue? Not, not for the BBC, no, not for the BBC. The gag they'd objected to was how to drink a cocktail and what to do with a cherry. Before the war, during the war, Auntie was very straight-laced. She wasn't called Auntie for nothing. And uh, he got himself banned on a number of occasions. He did this by the bad. They were walking along the boulevard one morning when all of a sudden she saw a hat in the shop window. She said, John, I like the hat. Buy it for me. He said, no, I've spent a lot of money. I'll buy it when you get back to town. She said, no, buy this one because I like it. It's nice. It'll suit me. He said, no, don't waste any time, Daddy. Let's go for a walk. So they went for a walk and as he was walking along, he saw a red lamp. See? <laughs> so he turned to the wife. He said, you still fancy the hat? She said, yes. He said, well, there's a pound. Go and get it. 
and take your time. Now, now, what he meant like was get a good one. Say, get a good one. Listen, she went to get the hat, he went on towards the red lamp, and when he got there, it turned green. Now, listen. There was a shoal of letters in protest. The BBC didn't officially ban him. They just didn't book him for nine years. Without the risque jokes that made him the cheeky chappy, Max lost his edge. He needed his gallery of saucy characters, the landlady, the honeymoon couple, the wife behind the door with a rolling pin, and of course, the bit of crackling. The most infamous joke was the one some say he told about meeting a naked girl on a narrow cliff path. He didn't know whether to block her passage or toss himself off. Perhaps he said it, perhaps he didn't. The story lives on. But when he went into the movies, they cleaned him up. And he lost the rapport that an audience gave him. Whenever he could, Max would escape on the train back to Brighton. There are stories of him jumping off the stage at the Hoban Empire when he realised his act was overrunning. Running up through the audience, through the foyer and into his taxi. Just so he could get back to his beloved Brighton. I worked with him at Finsbury Park Empire. And he said, you handled very well. So I said, why? So he said, a little bit of sea air do you the world of good. And I went down with him, night after night, from London to Brighton. And on a Saturday night, obviously, a little later than usual, and I thought, never catch this train. We get the cab to go to Victoria. We get out of the cab, and he's saying all the time, don't worry, don't worry. We arrived at Victoria Station. He ambled out of the cab, and the fellow with the bit on his hat said, you're very late tonight, Mr Miller. And he said, yes. They had held the train 12 minutes. That is power. That's why the man was looking. I lived with Max Miller and his wife in Brighton during the 1930s. My mother used to cook for them on special occasions when they entertained. And my father used to colour all his shoes and write out all the music um, part for the orchestra. And I got to know him very well as a child and as a teenager. He really was smashing. Um, and I liked him because occasionally he would give me half a crown, and, which was a lot of money in those days that I never had in any way. And uh, also his car was a fascination, and uh, occasionally when he had time he would whip me around the block. The Millers had no children, just parrots. It was my job to, to clean the three parrots out, and they had a little one, which was a real horror as far as I was concerned. I only had to look at it when it would start squawking. And at the time that I had my fingers nipped, was nobody's business. When Max flew home, he had his wings clipped. On stage, he let loose, perched on the footlights like one of his splendid parrots, dazzling in vivid colours, cracking naughty jokes and cackling filthy songs. Back in Brighton, she put the cloth over his cage. She ruled the roost. Listen, listen, he said, if you marry my daughter, I'll give you three acres and a cow. <laughs> you're quite right, you're quite right. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the three acres. Now, ooh. <laughs> now all together there, Mary. Oh, ain't a friend of my own. Max Miller never seemed to be ashamed of anything or his background. He was just himself. I think Mrs. Miller thought she was a little superior to everyone else. That's the impression I got, anyway. A little bit snobby about things, really, and a little bit plum in the mouth, you know, which he wasn't. I think she would have preferred it um, had he lived a more high-class lifestyle. Listen, listen, I went to a dance at the bottom of West Street, a one and six when hop. <laughs> and, and I was looking around for a nice piece of crackling. <laughs> listen, 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 and when I found what I was looking for, I went over to her and I raised my hat because the wife allows me to do that, you see. He used to call her mum sometimes. That used to make me wonder... You know, I mean, perhaps it was just a, a nickname he had for, but um, in my mind, I called my mum mum. And I didn't expect to find husbands calling their wife mum. One Saturday morning when I was off from school, Max was outside his house, and I thought I'd talk to him. I went up and I introduced myself to him. At that moment, he was going round to the shops. He asked if I'd like to go with him, and I said yes. And... Uh, I carried his bags, and we went to the grocers, the green grocers, the butchers. Max was really worse than any old woman there was in the shop, because one of his favourites was Edam cheese, and they could never cut it dead. 
on the half pound, but it used to sometimes go nine, nine and a half ounces. And when he put it on the scales and said to Max, that's nine and a half foot and satany, Max would say, no, take, take a hapeth off that. Not one penny piece did Max ever give me for every Saturday shopping I carried for him. And I was always very... But I liked Max. I liked him. He was a very nice chap. And he was someone that you could relate to. He, he was an, a very ordinary, run-of-the-mill fellow, and I used to get on with Max quite well, even as a boy. I went home the other night, there's a funny thing. And I went in the back way, through the kitchen, through the dining room, the drawing room. And there's a fella standing there, not a stitch on. Can you imagine that lady? <laughs> There's your memory, girl. <laughs> he hasn't got a stitch on. I called the wife in. I said, who's this? She said, don't lose your temper, Miller. Don't go raving mad. I said, I'm only asking a fair question. Who is it? She said, he's a nudist and he's coming to use a phone. There's a clever one from the wife, eh? <laughs> Oh, hello. <laughs> and I was lucky enough to be with Max in apple sauce. You'd only got to put his name up. And Pat jammed. You could never get in when Max was there. He just packed the place. He was a frightfully good-looking man. And he had tremendous sex appeal. He'd only got to walk onto the stage. He used to walk onto the girl and that look, and they were all going, Oh, oh. And he had such sex appeal. Though he wasn't a chaser of girls, he got an eye for a pretty face. And he loved them. He loved people. And he loved real things, do you know? And of course, he was a wonderful golfer. Marvellous golfer. When the show came to Brighton, Mrs. Miller kept a beady eye on him. I met her backstage at the Hippodrome. I think she thought I was a bit young to be around, you know. <laughs> but uh, the, the Max just wasn't like that. I've never seen him so much as pat a chorus girl's bottom. Ooh. In many ways, he was quite straight-laced. I think no cleavages were out. <laughs> the orchestra leader somehow missed about 12 bars of my music. And I came off stage and I was standing in the wings and I was going mad. I was swearing. I was saying, why doesn't this bloody man learn to read bloody music? And Max came along and quite solemnly said to me, don't swear, dear. I do not like to hear girls swear. I was really absolutely bowled over because it didn't sort of square with what people felt about Max. But I think he was, as a lot of comics are, I think basically quite a lonely man. He had a girlfriend who was the last possible girlfriend you'd think anybody would have. I mean, she was a tall, sort of cadaverous-looking woman, if as I remember her, rather like with a horse face. <laughs> I figured to myself that she must be a drinking companion to Max, because she was always there at the bar with him. What was his relationship with Anne Graham, do you think? We, in those days, were not quite as nosy as people are today. We minded our own business. She was a delightful person, and that was really all that concerned us. We loved Max, and it was nice to see him happy, and he certainly was happy with her. Anne Graham was known as Max's secretary and was his close companion for 20 years. He left her 7,000 pounds in his will. She was a bit of a weirdo to me, anyway. <laughs> but they both were. They, they were both wonderful characters. To me. I know exactly what you're saying to yourself. Why is he dressed like that? I tell you why I'm dressed like that. I'm an ARP woman. And when I finish here tonight, I go straight on to you. Put that night out. Last night I had fun. I went down and saw a lighter for the lady through my shed up. And I said, put that lighter. He said, well, I said, put that lighter. He said, you come and put it down. You left it on. You've got to be careful. Have it. on the army as a man. The fellow was telling me, I said, I can't, I can't see that at all. Don't get that at all. She couldn't get away with that. I said, how about when they all take a bath? Wouldn't they find out? He said, yeah, but who'd tell? <laughs> I don't like Ray. Oh, no, no, when that warning goes, my tummy goes right over. Honey. No, I can't help it. I can't help it, you see. It goes right over. It. Not running anybody down. <laughs> And this particular night, they were dropping them all over the place, dropping them all over the place to her. And there was a fellow running down the street in his shirt. 
Johnny's shirt running down the street. I said, where are you going? He said, oh, here. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Henry Hall speaking. I was producer of Henry Hall's Guest Night, or I suppose about four or five years after the war. And we were looking for things that other people weren't doing. And one of the things that other people weren't doing was, of course, offering Max Miller anything to perform. And so we came to an arrangement with Max and uh, said simply, Max, you know the rules. You give me a script. I know you're not going to perform that script word for word because you can't. But for goodness sake, stick roughly to it. And if you do that... You can go out front, do the thing your way. Did I tell you about the Yorkshireman who came to London? He couldn't get any Yorkshire put in. He went home and battered himself to death. Listen. By now, I was, you know, a fairly big name. And Max and I shared top of the bill, believe it or not. And he was closing the actual bill. I was closing the interval. I'd never actually met Max up to that date. And so finally, a stagehand walked across the stage and said, Charlie... Max says, would you like to change places with him? Because if you, clo if you close the bill and he closes you, he can get back to Brighton. And after all these years, I thought, what a cheat, you know. And yet, to offer me the top spot, which, which it was, but it welled up in me after all these years, you know, keeping me out. And I said, if Mr. Miller wants to change places with me, tell Max to bloody well walk across the stage and ask me himself, not send a stagehand. And he did, he lumbered across, he says, OK, Charlie, I said, yes, Max, as if we were great mates. By 1950, Max had been at the top for 20 years. He was very rich and famous and expected to be treated like a star. Max wasn't too happy when he heard that the American comedian, Jack Benny, had been given twice as much time as he had for his act. There were three Maxes sharing a dressing room at the Palladium that night. Jack Benny was working out front and now Max was looking at his watch and he realised that Jack Benny was doing far longer than he should have done and he got very impatient and uh, he said, um, I'll tell you straight, he said, I, I won't do the act, I rehearsed, he said, I'll do the white book and the blue book and Max Wall said to him, he said, whatever you do, my dear Max, your sheer artistry will bring you through. And he said, you can hold your noise and... Anyway, he goes on the stage. And on he came, looked up at the royal box, and he says, Which book do you want? And back from the royal box came the blue one. <laughs> on he went. And of course it was different. He'd done nothing like this at rehearsal. And he wouldn't come off. And they're all on the side going, Somebody chose a very quiet moment to say, say, get off, Max. And Max Miller turned around and he said, what do you mean, get off? He said, the Yanks have had a go, let the British Yanks have a go. If I stay on here, he said, I'll stay on till midnight, it's because they want to hear, am I right? And everybody said, yes, yes. And finally, Max kept finished, they came off. Suddenly the door bursts open, and Val Parnell, who was the head of Moss Empires, is livid with rage, and he looks at Max and he says, Miller, he says, you'll never work in one of my theatres again. I can see Max now just about to hang his hat up. And he said, Val, you're 60,000 quid too late. Still, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, it's nice to be rich. <laughs> and whether you're married or whether you're single, it's nice anyway. I asked him once, I said, Max, they say that you're mean. Is this true? He said, how do you mean mean? I said, well, they say you never tip the stage hands. He said, why should I tip the stage hands? He said, I go on the stage there. He said, they don't have to move a prop, nothing, like Charlie Coons has the piano or Hutch has the piano. I go on the stage. He said, they go out and have a drink for 25 minutes. He said, they should be paying me. He said, if it wasn't for me, they wouldn't be working. And that was his, the that was his theory. I don't think he was a mean man. Time was running out for the music halls. Now television was all the rage. Max tried to conquer the new medium. If you can't beat them, join them. Trouble was, it used up his material so fast, and he was slowing down. 
Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'll make that do. If I don't work fast tonight, please forgive me. I'm very tired. I've been shoplifting. And some of those shops are very heavy, I'll tell you. <laughs> and I know exactly what you're saying to yourselves. Why is he dressed like that? I'll tell you why I'm dressed like this. I've just come from a wedding. And a very sad wedding. And when I say sad, I mean sad. A poor old man, 80, married a young girl of 18. And you can't get anything sadder than that, can you? You're getting on for 1962. 63. When I was rehearsing with him at a midday music hall at home, he got quite a worry. He said, do you think that was a bit strong when I said on the radio? And, and when he was young, of course, he never cared. But he did worry quite. He was a very serious man, you know. He was very uh, frightened of illness. And he, he's, you know, he, had his, he was sort of an introvert, in a way. But, uh, he, you know, he, he used to get worried because he said, do you think that, that's a bit near the knuckle? I said, no, it's a double meaning. And he, it's funny, he turned out that way at the end. When I got home, I started packing me bag. The wife said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Paris. She said, what are you going to use for money? I said, Frank's. She said, Frank's not going. What are you talking about? Here. When I got over there, when I got a nice hotel, but the bedroom, oh, a shocking bedroom. I've never seen anything like it. A dirty big crack right down the wall. Because it didn't bother me because I couldn't understand it. It was in French, you see. <laughs> You have to be a little careful with Max now. He's towards the end of his performing life, and he did like the odd scotch. Now, if he'd had two, he was brilliant. If he had a third, and it was probably a double, his timing went. And here you have this brilliant artist, and if he'd had one too many, the timing went, and suddenly this greatness just simply disappeared. It wasn't there. There were no laughs. The gag had gone. And he was asked to do a charity night at the Regent Ballroom in Brighton. And my brother and I went to this. And after working with him all around Great Britain and seeing him get screams of laughter and loved and idolised, he struggled that night. They didn't know who he was, these youngsters. And it was, uh, it was very sad. Um, and we had a drink afterwards, and he says, well, this is time to come and a time to go, and I guess this is definitely my time to go. So it was a very sad last memory of him. Max became increasingly ill, and his performances had to stop. Some of his last appearances were opening bingo halls on the stages of the theatres he'd once played. Five and one, fifty-one. In 1963, he died of a heart attack at the age of 68. His wife, Kathleen, was by his side. His last words were, Oh, Mum. He said, Have you any children? She said, Yes. She said, I've got 13, but I'm not having any more. Not me, I've got my death aid. <laughs> he said, What's that got to do with the death aid? No, she said, every night when you go to bed, my husband would say to me, you going to sleep or what? And I would say, what? <laughs> now, it'll hurt me, won't it? I like the girls who do. I like the girls who don't. I hate the girl who says she will, and then she says she won't. But the girl I like the best of all, and I think you'll sound right, is the girl who says she never does. But she looks as though she... Here, listen... <laughs> 